All right, so welcome back, everybody, to the Global Symposium um, for the Leadership and Project Management from Northeastern University. Um, we're having great discussions, great presentations from yesterday and today. Um, what's interesting now, we're going to have a different twist on the presentations. We're talking about the healthcare industry. We uh, did not talk about the healthcare yesterday, so maybe today we'll get a chance to talk about the healthcare. Uh, today's presentation, or now, um, uh, this session presentation is about the strategic value-driven medical affairs. This is the title of the presentation, the leadership role of project and program management. We have with us a team of four uh, contributors. Um, we're going to start with Dr. Pratati Ganguli. Uh, Dr. Pratati is a distinguished leader in oncology and medical affairs, uh, serving as the CEO and the founder of the Medical Affairs Solutions since 2024. With over a decade of experience, she has driven transformative growth in healthcare. Previously, she excelled as a senior manager in medical affairs at Edwards Life Science and program manager and consultant at Seniors Health. Um, she has a very impressive background, so I couldn't read the whole thing. So we have more information about her in the website. Uh, second presenter, we have Dr. Prem. Sandy Vikram. Um, he is a seasoned board certified medical affairs professional. Uh, he's also recognized for his scientific acumen and medical voice within the pharmaceutical and medical devices industries. His specialization in, uh, is in oncology, hematology, and rare diseases demonstrate his commitment to advancing medical knowledge across diverse fields. I'm very happy to have you with us. Uh, the third contributor is Sha Shashi Singh. Shashi Singh is an agile evangelist with over 20 years of experience helping Fortune 500 companies achieve value through leadership and effective project management processes and techniques. Last but not least, Dr. Sriram. Dr. Sriram serves as the global head of agile strategy um, and training services at Inflector. He is also an assistant nature professor with the College of Professional Studies here at Northeastern University. We're happy to have all of you with us today. Looking forward to listen to your presentation. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Amar. And it's it's a pleasure to be here. And, and thank you so much for the opportunity to present. Um, I guess, the in my opinion, I think the first opportunity for a medical affairs to be present in a project management conference like this and to all the experts in, in the world. Um, yeah, so the reason why we wanted to present this this specific topic is more about the need for project and program management experts and specialists in training in the medical affairs. So I'll let my colleague, Dr. Bratati, take over this presentation for the, for, the, for the brief introduction and also talk about what is medical affairs and where does it sit in a bigger pharmaceutical or medical healthcare space in, in, in the industry. Uh, and then I'll come back and talk a little bit about like what's the need and of course, Dr. Sriram would join me um, as well in terms of the project management. So Bharati, um, the floor is yours. Thank you, Prem. <clears throat> Today we are going to talk about, uh, can you go back to the first slide? Thank you. Today we're going to talk about the strategic value-driven medical affairs, the leadership role of project and program management. And before we, next. And before we delve into the details of um, talking about how we have planned out the story and laid the story for you, I would like to take a minute to talk about the different topics that we are going to cover in this discussion and presentation. First, we will introduce medical affairs. Then we are going to talk about value proposition in medical affairs. Next, we will talk about the imperatives of strategic alignment to enhance medical affairs values. Then we are going to talk about the impact of technological advancements, followed by medical affairs operations, the current practices. And then we are going to change gears, talk about program and project management within medical affairs, the challenges and the missed opportunities. And then we will end the talk by talking about how we can empower medical affairs and end the session by a summary. Next, please. So as we talk here, it's often known as that medical affairs is a strategic pillar in the pharmaceutical and medical device sectors. Why do we say that? I want to draw your attention to the figure that is on the left side of the slide. 
It clearly says and depicts that medical affairs sits right in between research and development and commercial operations. Medical affairs complements research and development and commercial operations through uh, or for strategic alignment and value demonstration. And medical affairs is able to do this only because medical affairs is an amalgamation of scientific knowledge and medical knowledge. And that's why medical affairs is known as a strategic pillar in the pharmaceutical and medical device industries. Medical affairs also serves as a one voice, one medical voice for the uh, healthcare community, uh, be it the HCPs or the patients. And medical affairs also educates and supports the healthcare ecosystem. And that's why we say that medical affairs is the third strategic pillar. Next. Now I have already established that, okay, medical affairs is the third strategic pillar, but how does it sit in this healthcare ecosystem? And now in this slide, I want to establish that medical affairs sits right at the center as a fulcrum and all the other diverse stakeholders interact, engage with medical affairs. As you can see from the figure, medical affairs not only interacts and engages with research and development and commercial operations, which we all know about, but I want to also engage and talk about the other engagements and the associations and the uh, affiliations that medical affairs has with other partners, other diverse partners. And medical affairs also aligns with the strategic goals of all these stakeholders. So the first stakeholder, key stakeholder for medical affairs is, apart from R&D and commercial operations, is field medical team. This team is a bridge between the HCP or the healthcare community and the organization. This team interacts with the HCP, collects the information as the insight, and then brings it back to the team. The next key stakeholder is medical affairs strategy. This team supports the clinical trial design and execution and also develops medical strategies. The next one is regulatory affairs. This team ensures regulatory compliance. The next one is medical operations. This team oversees the operational aspect of medical affairs. The next one is scientific communication. And this team develops and disseminates scientific content. Now, as you can very clearly see, Medical Fest sits at the center of these stakeholders. They are diverse. Their unmet needs are diverse. And Medical Affairs puts that effort of aligning the strategic goals for each and every diverse stakeholder. Next slide, please. So why? The question is, why Medical Affairs needs to put in all these efforts of not only interacting, engaging with diverse stakeholders, but align with their individual unmet needs and strategic goals? The answer is that Medical Affairs drives value through these strategic alliances. How? Firstly, Medical Affairs provides scientific insights for clinical trial designs, regulatory submissions, evidence generation to meet the clinical and the business needs. Medical Affairs interacts and communicates with HCPs, KOLs, patients, patient advocacy groups, and they, it forms a bridge between the stakeholders and the organization. Thirdly, Medical Affairs drives innovation, which in turn enhances patient care and resource utilization. So I'm very sure you would be very convinced with me now that not only Medical Affairs is the third strategic pillar, but it adds tremendous value through its engagements, associations for all the diverse stakeholders. And this is how Medical Affairs sits actually in the ecosystem, in the healthcare ecosystem. Now we want to also ask the question, does the, org, where, does the roles and responsibilities of Medical Affairs change as there is an organizational structure change? And my answer is, it depends really on the uh, on the on the size of the organize, organization. One size fits all strategy or approach does not work here. For example, for in large pharma, we have extensive medical affairs departments with specialized teams. But in small pharma, we know that if they have leaner teams. In large pharma, the budgets are more flexible and more accessible. But in small pharma. Uh, the budgets are more restricted. So they focus more on niche therapeutic areas or innovative treatment strategies. Similarly, in large pharma, the scientific exchanges are very deep and are very extensive. In small pharma, 
They mostly leverage digital tools and platforms for their engagements. The next one is, of course, we know this very much that the solutions that are provided by, by large pharma are very extensive, comprehensive, and in-house. Whereas in small pharma, they rely external, rely on external partnerships and collaborations. Now, I have already said that medical affairs is the third strategic pillar. It demonstrates tremendous value by interacting and engaging with diverse stakeholders. And it, it adds a lot of value to not only the stakeholders, but also to the uh, medical community, the healthcare community, and to the patient community. And if medical affairs has to continue uh, this uh, value proposition or this uh, demonstration of value, we propose that as the times and the landscape of medical affairs is changing, what the need of the art is that we need more improved effectiveness, we need greater efficiency, we need robust evidence generation and enhanced patient care. And we propose that in order to continue what medical affairs has been continuing, there are three big pillars that medical affairs has to focus and strengthen. Embrace digitalization, leverage real world evidence, and uh, prioritize patient-centric approaches. When I say embrace digitalization, I mean have more visual, uh, visual advisory boards, participate more in digital symposiums, just like the one we are doing now, and also engage with more DOLs, the digital opinion leaders, engage them more, collect more real-time data, and engage and have a more impactful presence in the social media and engage through that platform. That's digitalization. The next pillar is leveraging real world evidence. And in this, we are advocates of having evidence-based decision-making. And the reason why we are a big advocates of that is because we want to see more optimized treatment strategies. We want to address the unmet needs. And now I will move on to the third pillar, which is the prioritizing of uh, the patient-centric approaches. This is very important, we feel, because it incorporates patient voice. And by involving patient voice, um, why this is critical is because medical affairs is sitting very unique in a very unique position where medical affairs interacts very closely with the patient community with the patient advocacy groups so they are, they build a trusted partnership with the patient community they can understand what are the unmet uh, or the un, uh, um, unidentified uh, gaps treatment gaps that are there what are the unmet needs of the patient community that can be brought in as a feedback loop to the medical affairs strategy team or to the organization so that strategies can be changed develop more personalized strategies for treatment, right? So we truly believe that if we embrace digitalization, leverage real world evidence, and have a more personalized and prioritized patient-centric approaches, we will be able to demonstrate even more value through medical affairs. So now I'll pause, I'll hand over the virtual mic to Prem to carry on the discussion. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Bharati. And it was a wonderful um, section of it. Like, well, like Bharati was trying to mention about medical affairs is the one medical voice of a pharmaceutical and a medical device industry, right? And she mentioned about the need for digitalization, the need for uh, understanding the real world insights, the real world information. That's it's actually, that's more than what we can get from the clinical trials, which is a skewed population. And also she talked about the patient centricity where we bring patients at the center stage in making all the clinical decisions, right? So those are the key components that's that's kind of evolving in medical affairs that's becoming more priority in these days. Um, well, of course we have witnessed a remarkable transformation driven by uh, the digital technologies, especially uh, over the past decade, I would call, and we, which we have uh, reshaped the priorities, structure, and resources within medical affairs, right? Um, for example, like during COVID, like, you know, between 2020 and now, we have seen a significant shift in the digital transformation where, um, you know, I mean, everyone in this room, I believe, have experienced a substantial increase in the use of the social media platforms to engage with the healthcare providers. And by the way, when Ben Bradley was mentioning about HCPs and KOLs, HCPs are nothing but healthcare providers and KOLs are nothing but key opinion leaders. That's what we call in our language. So um, 
There are a few components that I wanted to touch upon is that the real world evidence, which Bradley was trying to mention as well. Like I said, it's, it's been revolutionizing the medical affairs by generating the real world impact data, how that drug is actually working in the real world as opposed to what we tested in the lab or in the clinical trials. The next one, like I was mentioning about the patient-centric approaches where um, what are the opportunities to engage these patients and adv advocacy groups, making sure that the patient needs and needs and experiences are at the forefront of our healthcare strategies. And of course, uh, when it comes to working with the patients in the real world, there's an absolute need for cross-functional alignment and a collaboration, right? So, and and of course, there's, there's involves a lot of data, a lot of um, regulated data that we, we have to deal with. And we have to um, be very careful and cognizant in using this data and communicating this data to our external stakeholders, which is patients or physicians, or even nurses or any healthcare pro providers or practitioners. And we also want to be very careful in this thing. So the reason of this slide is to show you the opportunities that we have to evolve in the emerging healthcare landscape. Sriram, if you can go to the next slide, please. So, excuse me. So um, while we discuss on the technological advancements and the need and the opportunities we have in medical affairs, it is also important to understand how we do the medical affairs operations right now, right? Um, so that's more important to understand the problem we have so that we know how to fix it. The other opportunity we think we have today is to open up this this um, this opportunities to the project management world and see if you can help us understand any better ways to fix this or even we're open to have a partnership with you and collaborate with you to understand that way we can come up with a new innovation that's exactly where we believe the innovation would start so um so engagement with the healthcare providers collaborating with the external partners you know um so creating a diverse uh, collaboration opportunities. And these are the opportunities we have right now, like I mentioned in my previous slide, but unfortunately the current practices, what we have in the medical affairs, um, this is more based on the, the historical characteristics that is, there's actually a potential roadblock for medical affairs organization. That is, and it's practices in the evolving healthcare landscape, because why do I say that? Um, one, of course, Unfortunately, like I said, we have the historical perspective of being more siloed and we work, um, you know, uh, in vertically and we don't, we are, we don't have the culture of cross-functional collaboration, which I, we believe we, try, we started to understand that it is crucial, crucial for optimizing the resource utilization and improving overall efficiency. And then we also need to um, define what, what do we mean by customer experience? Because in this case, we have patients as a customer, and then it's hard to understand that unified customer ex experience. So we need to find ways to see how can we identify that experience of a customer, of a patient, and integrate those diverse skill sets um, to enhance the impact of medical affairs. And we also need to build effective governance models and robust um, uh, capabilities and a strong infrastructure. And, you know, because we need to measure what is the outcomes and what do we call a success in terms of like patient in, in terms of the outcomes, what we do as a medical affairs organization, because we don't have a number to show that we sold this many because we, we sell science, we sell the, the science as a value. So we, I, we understand there is a need for significant change within the medical affairs operations. And, and uh, so that's exactly why the reason we, we thought this would be a great opportunity for our team to present in this forum and try to uh, get some expert advice in the future. Next slide, please. And uh, like Brother was mentioning, we would like to switch a little bit gear here and on, on the project and program management approaches in medical affairs. And, and I already touched upon the current challenges and, and based on the current practices and the need for it. Next slide, please. So um, while there are like several challenges we have in medical affairs, especially in terms of uh, managing uh, the, the, the operations and, and, and the programs and stuff like that, I want to call out a couple of things here. One, of course, there is the better uh, need, I mean, there's a need for better communication uh, approaches. Like, right? you know, there's a significant challenges in communication. That could be the reason why we work in silos all the time. So um, 
we need to have a standardized approach, which often um, you know, uh, can help align among the cross-functional stakeholders, our team members. And the next one is we have a, like I said, a limited stakeholder engagement. Like, um, so when we talk about the stakeholder engagement, we also talk about the internal and external stakeholder engagement. And also we talk about like how we communicate with our healthcare professionals, how we communicate with the patients, because everyone speaks a different language in this case, right? So we need to find like innovative ways of communicating with all the stakeholders and see if we can optimize, you know, uh, our value in that. And of course, um, there is a significant need for uh, improvement in the resource utilization. That is another area of concern. Um, in I just came out of a meeting right now because where I clearly see any big organization, I represent Pfizer Pharma, we see a significant need for planning and allocation of resources ahead of time. So we always run around at the last minute. And of course, that's actually leading to a lot of wastage and delays and, and a lot of uh, inefficiency in all the projects we do sometimes. Um, and of course, we also be little, be a little more cognizant about the risk management strategies and see like what are the pitfalls and what are the fallback strategies we have and how can we uh, be prepared for everything instead of like, you know, uh, working on the on the, uh, the last minute. So we see these as our, our, these are the challenges we have. And, and of course, we also see these are the opportunities we have for, for the future. Can I can I go to the next slide, please? So um, again, uh, building on my previous slide, and there is a significant need for project management training and that we strongly believe is crucial for medical affairs function. And then in, in, in several aspects, and I wanted to list at least four of these based on what Bradley was trying to mention in the previous slides. One is definitely to improve the medical strategy uh, planning and the, the strategic imperatives needs to be clearly, um, uh, you know, uh, to be clearly uh, defined and, and be transparent. And of course, we need to strongly build the power of foundation. Um, and also, uh, we need to find ways to see how can we plan it better, and that way we can gain uh, the stakeholder buy-in and, and, and you know, uh, be a little more efficient in that. And of course, you know, we think the project management leadership within the medical affairs function um, can serve as a better leader in not only managing the operations, but also helping the medical affairs organization understand the longer vision for a pharmaceutical industry or a medical device industry. So these are the things we believe the project management um, within the medical affairs needs to strengthen itself. And, and um, so we can, have, we can provide a better value. Next slide, please. Uh, again, these slides are kind of building on what I've been um, uh, trying to mention in my previous slides and how medical affairs can deliver value. I don't want to go into the details as like I'm talking to the, um, the the project management experts here, which I would definitely leave it at your hands to uh, to judge where the help is needed, where we can work together as a team and, and drive the innovation and drive all the priorities that we have within medical affairs. Next slide, please. Uh, here, I would like to hand... Uh, the presentation to Dr. Sriram, who is an expert, as you all know, in project management. Um, uh, Sriram, please go ahead. Thanks, uh, <clears throat> Preman, uh, Dr. Preman, Dr. Pratati here. So in this particular slide, I wanted to bring the focus uh, back into what is the portfolio program and uh, you know project. Many times people think project management um, is uh, what we are trying to deliver as part of a product, service, or result, like you know, temporary uh, endeavor to deliver a unique product or service or result. But what is the value here? What is the value proposition in this particular case? When you look at this, uh, the number of uh, different stakeholder groups that uh, is lying in between the commercial operations and the scientific community, there are too many things. Uh, Dr. Prem was mentioning everybody speaks different language, you know, so in one needs to be able to converse in these different stakeholder groups and speak their language. Language. So from that angle, the portfolio is uh, going to be the highest form of information where the medical affairs is going to be focusing on. So medical affairs is becoming the portfolio. So within that medical affairs, there is going to be a focus primarily on comprehensive, holistic, organizational health care. That is the, the focus here. But within that, when you take a look at that spectrum of health initiatives that come up, there is going to be something that is preventative and something that is going to be curative or corrective. 
So when you look at that kind of discussion here, you are looking at different departments within that uh, healthcare and wellness uh, function, uh, which are considered as programs. Each and every one of them is focusing on providing something very specific, like a cancer versus um, um, you know, uh, men's disease versus uh, women's disease, uh, you know, um, uh, diabetes, and, you know, each and every one of them is becoming a specialized, unique function, but that's not it. When you take a look at that, how do I make sure that all these things are working together? That becomes the program. So the portfolio is focusing more on how do I select the right kind of initiative? How do I prioritize my, you know, amount of time and resources that are available here? And how do I constantly optimize the, the way they are working together and balance them. That is the enterprise value that we are trying to focus on. And when you take that to the next level of what the programs are uh, focusing on, they are focusing on benefits. Some could be iterative benefits, some could be incremental benefits, some could be consolidated benefits, some could be unified benefits. So what are those different types of benefits and how do we make sure that different departments, different business units are working together to ensure things are getting done? It's okay to have a wonderful drug that is going to solve you know, world hunger, but then if you're not going to operationalize these things so that these, these drugs are available to different people at different points in time, well, then you haven't met the need. So the benefits is going to be evaluated by the with degree to the extent they cater to the value, right? So coordinating the management of related projects to achieve specific strategic business value. So the connection is between the business value and how we are working together. And um, both Dr. Prem and Dr. Pratati was mentioning how much, you know, there are different types of stakeholders, how much there are different types of values that we need to bring them together and stuff like that. And that is a huge thing. This is not as simple as um, I have have a software that I'm developing and the software is now on the cloud versus responsive design, you know, it's a lot more uh, different than, you know, from a software thought process here. Right. And then when you are moving into the next level of about projects, these are specifically focusing on the treatment for success. Like I have a specific drug like COVID that came out with, uh, you know, a specific drug that we have come up with. And how is it actually targeting uh, the, the success and how are we measuring that? What are the measures that we are using to actually measure that? And you know, all those elements come into the play. So they are really focused, time-borne initiatives that are really focusing on certain things. You can come and say, I'm going to do an agile surgery here because the patient cannot be open repeatedly three times because we are working on an agile iterative approaches. If you take a look at a software as a medical device, uh, you know, something that is implanted on your body, he can come back and say, well, you know, we the, our first iteration was on this particular one and now we had to open the uh, patient and, you know, make an update to this particular one because we never think about what the uh, updates uh, potential possibility in, in the software that, uh, in the medical device that we are actually, you know, implanting. So these are um, considerations that you have to keep in mind in terms of how the projects, how the programs, and how the portfolio connect together. So the capabilities that we are providing is going to actually connect with the benefits and the benefits have to be identified, analyzed, delivered, transitioned and sustained in order for us to generate the value. So that is the important thing that we are talking about in terms of, you know, that uh, connection here. So how do we empower uh, the medical efforts? You know, so there is a, a thought process that uh, Dr. Prem was mentioning over here, like, you know, this is our need and you tell us how you can, you know, meet this need. And I want to shift the gears a little bit in terms of how people should think, uh, how the project managers should lead. So both the leadership as well as the management aspects is extremely critical here. But what happens here is, uh, most often people come back and say, oh, you're going to do an agile uh, and scrum approaches and you're going to you know, enhance the collaboration between these two members. And agile works great within one particular team. Even if you take a look at agile, we are talking about uh, you know, seven plus or minus two members. But when you take a look at those uh, stakeholders, the stakeholder groups are you know, seven plus or minus uh, two here. So there is a lot more stakeholders within each and every one of them, so like regulatory. If you go there, there is gonna be medical, legal, uh, and then uh, uh, regulations, MLR team that people talk about. So there's a lot more uh, functions within each and every one of those things that we need to look at. 
So yes, we, maybe we may have to do SIF. Maybe we have to do discipline nudge. Maybe we have to do program planning. Maybe there is so many other things that come into play. So it's not going to be as simple as a, I'm going to put together a sprint uh, workflow, an iteration workflow, and we are going to continue doing this. It will work, but you need to make sure that you are agile at the portfolio and program level, not at your individual team levels alone. So there is need there is a need here for us to adopt the framework so that you customize them to be a methodology within your specific organization. What works for a specific uh, department uh, within medical affairs may not necessarily scale well for another department in the same organization. So we need to be able to pivot accordingly. So those are the elements to the agile and scum approaches that we are not even talking about at this particular point, even safe, even dad, even nexus, less, and all these things do not address these uh, elements at all because we are becoming more and more technique driven and tool driven, not necessarily management and leadership driven. So when you take a look at those things, the lean business value approaches come into play. I've been talking about value repeatedly, right? So when you take a look at these things, the visual representation of the steps in the process, what adds value? What does not add value? How do I, I identify the waste? And we have different types of waste, right? Um, that we can talk about at a later point, but the different types of waste and how do I optimize the workflow? And this has to be a constant process within your projects, programs, operations, and portfolio, not just one element alone. Right. Then when you take a look at maximizing the value, first of all, we need to identify the value. And what are the different types of values? In my humble opinion, based upon my agile transformation journeys that I have done for different types of industries, um, I have come up with five important values, right? Which is going to be customer value add. Who is our customer and how does the customer actually get the benefit? And that's going to be the degree of benefit that we are getting towards the end. How did it change my lifestyle? How am I better off because I am using your particular product and things like that? At the same time, we need to think about the business value add. We have to do certain things because we are doing uh, as a part of a business. A pharma has to adhere to certain rules and regulations, uh, Sunshine Act, for instance, um, or PDMA Compliance Act, for instance. These are regulations that we have to comply with. You know, if you go back to the thalidomide example, like long time back, uh, the medicine that people took, and as a result of uh, you, you know the medicine that people took for morning sickness, you know the 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 the, the babies that were born were you know having fissures instead of arms, right? Uh, we are not in that uncontrolled regulated society right now. We are in a lot more regulated society now. It takes about ten to twelve years uh, for a drug to actually you know hit the market. Um, and what are some of those things that we need to consider in every one of those phase one, phase two, phase three trials? That needs to be thought through. So business value add is very important. As you are focusing on the customer value and the business value, what is the process value? Why should I adopt this particular way of working? Why should I ap apply this particular lean way of thinking? Where should I? When should I apply Six Sigma? When should I apply Agile? Where should I mix the hybrid? And where should I think through you know complete uh, plan-driven approaches? So it's not like I'm going to go with plan-driven approaches alone or I'm going to go with adaptive approaches alone. You need to be able to pick and choose the right tool at the right time in the right place at the you know, right uh, you know, integrated uh, approach. And then look at the technology. Technical value add. What is the technology that you are trying to use here? So yes, we have lots of tools here. So can I ask Chad GPT to say, hey, here is a drug. Please come up with all the different uh, you know, insights. Yeah it is going to come up with some kinds of insights, but are these the right kinds of insights? Would I trust my drug uh, to a chat GPT, at least at this point? Will I trust my um, care to uh, a virtual doctor uh, from you know, Metaverse? I don't know at this point. You know, maybe in 10 years from now, I will be able to, but not at least at this particular point. So what are the technical value add that we need to start thinking through in software as a medical device, software in a medical device, um, the software that is used to actually create and you know guide your things. Even an example of a BMI you know, calculator, as soon as you are putting all these numbers and say, this is my BMI index, it is changing your behavior, the way you are going to operate. Is that the right tool? Should I use different considerations at this point? So these are all things to keep in mind. Customer value, business value, process value, and technical value. And the, if the time and energy that you are spending, money that you are spending, is not in any one of those four important buckets, I come up with the last one, which is a catch-all, non-value add. 
these are the maximizing value add components. So we need to focus on each and every one of them and then put continuous improvement in mindset. It's not it's not uh, actually words. These are practices, which means you are looking at incremental innovation as well as radical innovation. How do I change the way we are going to you know, um, uh, operate? And if you take a look at some of those uh, you know, uh, countries where access to healthcare is a dream, how do I get these medicines in the right place to the right people? Uh, a protective you know, gear like a gloves is is common here, whereas it is not common in other places. You know, sometimes people use the, uh, the clothes for the third or fourth time. Is this going to add value? No, probably not. So medical advice have to start thinking in terms of what are the ways our drug will not be actually accepted. So these are the insights that we need to come in with and, you know, uh, provide uh, just-in-time delivery. What do we have to do just in that particular production? But it's not about the the production alone, but it's also looking at the cost of production. So both the focus on efficiency, which is operational excellence, as well as effectiveness, which is leadership. So the project managers have to start thinking completely differently. It's no longer like, you know, I have come up with the PMP certifications, I have the PMBOK knowledge, I have all these things, but it's able to think through the procurement, the stakeholder engagement, through the risk management, through the change management, and, 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 and then getting into all the communication, um, the, the scope, schedule, cost, uh, you know, quality, and all those things as well. And decentralized decision-making, this is extremely important. Many times people expect somebody to tell them the answer. But when you take a look at Agile, what is the fundamental thing that makes Agile you know, different? It's a self-organization, accountability at the team level. Yes, there is going to be an accountable PO product owner or a you know, project manager, if you think of it in a different context. But then we have to be able to empower people to enable decision making within the guidance, within the governance, within the guardrails. How do we do that? How do we promote that? And then the lean culture, how do we ensure that we are solving the right problem? How do we come up with the different ways of incremental and iterative innovation to be able to solve the right problem? These are thought processes that lean business value promotes. And these are the things that we have to uh, come up with in the today's world of project managers, program managers, and even portfolio managers, so that they are able to empower medical advice because they are trusting us. They are coming and asking, we need help from you. But if you are coming up with a, you know, theoretical foundations alone and not necessarily the practical elements of it, we're not going to solve their problem. We are in fact creating more problem instead of helping we are hurting. Right? So we need to start thinking this. So we need to move beyond the words agile and scrum and to really think lean business thinking, systems thinking, decision uh, you know, element. Um, all these things have to come into play. Right. So empowering project management for the evolution, you know, it, it is in the early stages, but, you know, it is, uh, you know, going at a very accelerated pace. So improved project selection. This is something that I already mentioned in the portfolio selection use of the AI and, you know, uh, machine learning algorithms to analyze the data so that you are you are identifying the right projects. You are initiating the project that has not been identified by the team, by the business, and you are going to the steering committee and governance teams and telling like, this is what we need to do. So we are expecting that kind of a leadership in the project managers and program managers and not necessarily do what the project uh, charter asks you to do. You may Sometimes you may have to create the business case or even the project charter monitoring the progress. How do I use some of these uh, tools that are currently available to monitor in real time, what is the problem that's happening? There's no point in telling that it's a rule of seven in you know Six Sigma. Those of you that know Six Sigma will relate to this. There is no point in telling there is a rule of uh, you know seven, there is this upper control limit, lower control limit, threshold and all those things. But how do we actually use this using the AI and ML technologies to be able to make better, quicker decisions. So the more, better, cheaper, faster, and still be happier, that, that, that thought process have to come into play. Speed up the reporting process. In other words, I'm not talking about this transactional reporting. I'm talking more about the transformational reporting. Yes, earned value management is important. Yes, velocity is important, but these are not uh, you know, leading indicators, they are lagging indicators. Now that I know what I know, what should the team be doing to be able to succeed? That's the re reporting I'm talking about. And then facilitating testing. Testing here is primarily within the context of medical affairs here, but facilitating quality 
How do I make sure that I'm using all these testing processes, test-driven development, or you know, phase one, phase two, phase three trial, or hypothesis-driven development, risk-driven development? How do I make sure that I'm doing all these things to promote higher level of quality in the products, service, or research? Because at the end of the day, if you go back to the you know the project uh, program portfolio hierarchy, if you look at that, products is you are going to be your your denominator. Projects are delivering this. Programs are deli part of projects. Portfolio are part of programs and projects. So everything is focused on products that needs to be produced of higher quality. And in the keynote, we talked about how some of the functions, the product itself becomes a feature of uh, you know uh, ongoing products uh, in today's world. And medical of course is exactly requiring that kind of thought process from us. So. With that, I will turn it back to um, you. Um, yes. Frame. Uh, sorry, Pratati. For your yes, yes. <laughs> so now we have come to that phase where we have to summarize our presentation. And in summary, I will say there are four big highlights that we take home. The value proposition in medical affairs. We cannot ignore that medical affairs sits at the center, is the third strategic pillar, and, and is contributing immense value and demonstrating immense value, not just to the diverse stakeholders, but to the healthcare community, to the patient community. And we will continue to do that. In terms of the future of medical affairs, what we are seeing here is that we believe that medical affairs will continue to demonstrate value, but it will also be influenced by technological advancements and data analytics in the future. And we believe that if we incorporate, uh, like I mentioned earlier in my talk, uh, embrace digitalization, leverage real world evidence and and bring in patient centric approaches, we will be able to demonstrate value in the future as well. And in the future to make medical affairs even more stronger even more robust we truly believe as a team that the project management leadership and the program management leadership will play a very crucial and a critical place in the future because we want to understand and learn the tools from project management the tactics the strategies and bring it to medical affairs create that indispensable program manager or project manager in a leadership role who can drive the operations, streamline the operations end to end, and then in, uh, enhance patient care and ultimately facilitate growth and transformation in the field. So with that, we have come to the end of our presentation. This are, these are the references that we used for uh, creating the manuscript and the slide deck. And uh, next slide. Can you go a slide uh, before this? That is oh, okay. 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 So, uh, and, and yeah, so um, thank you for listening. Thank you for giving us this platform to, uh, as a team, to bring us, bring out the, the ideas that we had of merging in medical affairs and project management together. So now we open the stage for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Pratati, uh, Dr. Prem, Dr. Suram. Um, what an outstanding presentation about the healthcare industry. And uh, for me, I've learned a lot from, from today's presentation. Um, there are no questions in the chat, but I actually have a lot of questions myself. Uh, so maybe we'll give a chance to others to think if they have any questions, they can put it in the chat box. I'm really interested in the healthcare industry myself. Um, uh, and And... I see there is a lot of potential, whether it is in project management, operations management, supply chain management, there's always a potential there. And I, I believe also there are some issues that need to be tackled. So I'm, I'm going to ask you specific questions that came from uh, the slides that you presented, which actually intrigued my interest. So one of the slides, you talked about the value propositions in terms of uh, medical affairs and trying to digitize or um, transform the uh, operations into the digital world. And you talked about the real-time data collection. I'm really interested in knowing what type of real-time data collection are you interested in? And the reason why I'm asking this question, because we do research in terms of the internet of things and how we collect data in the supply chain management and try to make decisions in real time. So I'm really interested to know what type of data are you talking about here? 
No, I would like to start, and of course, Brother T, please chime in if wherever you see appropriate. Um, so that's a great question, in fact. And when we talk about the data, for example, like we have, like let's let's take a step back here. So when we have a drug uh, uh, that's been marketed in in the industry, right? Because it goes through several processes. Like Sridham was mentioning, the drug goes through twelve years of um, uh, stringent. Um, evaluation before it gets to the market, right? Um, there's the clinical trials and all the curated information, like the skewed information that takes place. But when the market is out in the market, like when people started using like across the globe, it, it might work differently for different people, right? Um, so uh, people from India, for example, might have a different reactions as opposed to people back in the Western countries because the living conditions, the socioeconomic status, everything is going to be different between people. So we would like to hear from that data. I mean, we would like to hear the physician's perspectives, like how they feel the patients are feeling about the drug, or even the patient's perspectives and how they feel about it. There's a lot of social um, uh, social media uh, you know, information out there. Like we would like to listen to those uh, conversations. We like to tap into the, all those forums to understand what's been out there, what people are talking about this this drug and how it's actually working in the real world, right? Um, so, and that is, that is one of the data I'm trying to think about. And also, um, for example, um, for ex so what are the adverse events? Like, um, what is the noise? Because especially in the social media, there's more noise than the information, right? It could be a lot of misleading information that you don't want to get carried away with. Like, if you start addressing each and every um, noise that you hear in a social media and you will never grow in your organization, right? So we will have to see how we can curate that information, filter that information and collect this impactful insights is what we call like actionable insights, right? And, and of course, when we go for these conferences, I'm sure like you heard of all these healthcare conferences, for example, the oncolo oncology conferences, we have around 30,000 to 40,000 people attend each conference, right? There's so many conversations that happens around in the, con in the three days or four days of the conference. And there's a lot of social media uh, discussions happens in YouTube or like in X or um, you know in Facebook or LinkedIn, whatsoever. How can we collect all those information to make sure that we are not missing uh, any information or we're not leaving any stones unturned at this point? So these are few data I can think of at this point, right. just, just top of my mind. But as you can imagine, Patients are our customers, physicians are our customers. So there's a lot of information that's out there which we would like to hear back from them so that we can make our product, our drug better and, and uh, you know work better and be safe and e efficient. So uh, Bharati, I will leave it uh, for you to add anything if you have anything more to add. Uh, great explanation, Prem. I just want to add to the, the, the thing that Prem said is, not just these avenues, but the additional avenue is, if you remember from my, from my presentation, I said field medical teams. The field medical team is a very important link between the HCP or the KOL and the medical strategy team. They are our in, in, inside bearers. They actually, this team actually captures all the insights that Prem was earlier mentioning and brings it to the medical strategy team. And those are real informations that we get all these 12 years that the drug, uh, in the life cycle management of the drug that the drug goes through. But that's like the initial phase where the, the HCP also decides about the investigated investigator initiated trials also happen because of those discussions. So these are the few aspects that we think that we are collecting real-time data and then we are kind of molding or uh, tactfully changing our strategies. So I'll pause here the, the, with this. Interesting, very interesting, uh, <clears throat> which which makes sense uh, because that's where you need to have real-time data to, to make decisions, which I think it's one of the areas for collaborations between us and you as we do research in that domain, which would lead me to the next question that Dr. Prem talked about, which is that we need to have collaboration uh, between the university and the industry. So what type of collaborations, um, as you called it, partnership as well, are you looking for? Because uh, I, I'm sure I'm interested and others are interested in, in collaboration and partnership. So if you can elaborate on that, it would be great. Well, absolutely. I mean, again, 
uh, well, there's so many things that we don't know yet in the sense like, um, because there's, there's that many number of opportunities we have within and we are only presenting what we know at this point based on the pain points we go through, the challenges we go through at this time. Like being an expert, you should be able to help us understand like, hey, you are looking at the wrong problems. You may have more problems than what you think. Like more importantly, if you will, like as we were trying to explain in our presentation, there is a significant need for cross-functional collaborations because when you are making a decision in terms of a drug or, uh, or a product, you, it's not going to be one person who's going to make the decision because it's going to be a much more data-driven decisions that needs to be made, more of a strategic decision that needs to be made. So there is a need for a cross-functional alignment. What is the organizational goal? What is the scientific message we would like to send out? What is it? How is it working outside in the world? So that is the thing. So the second one is, of course, like Sridham was mentioning about um, being a little more efficient and because I was trying to text in my, I mean, put the message in my chat boxes that, the one thing that we hear in pharmaceutical industry is to do more with less, like right? yeah. which means we don't have money, but we want you to do more, right? So for that, I'm guessing like, it's not like we're trying to compromise the quality of the things we do, but it's more about how can you plan better that way you don't have to spend money at the last minute or maybe put too much resources into it. So we need a better planning in terms of thing. And also, you know, with the with, with like any other industry, I would say even like medical industry is a little more, uh, uncertain in the states, like there's a lot of shifting landscape, there's a lot of moving parts across the lane, because you think the drug is going to do like this, and maybe it's not, maybe it's it's not doing this, what you think it should be doing, right? So you will need to be a little more better planned in a way that you, what's your second secondary plan, like, and what would you do if things didn't go well? And so that is something which we see uh, uh, as a medical affairs professional is lacking within the industry that we don't see that, we don't foresee that i would say that yes. we don't foresee that so how do we foresee that you know uh, how do we work as a team to understand like well what if this happens like what if so that is a question we need to keep asking ourselves which in my opinion being like n is equal to one medical affairs professional just i'm not trying to generalize but i don't know personally yeah you know yeah. it's it's it, in my opinion i always think it's better to not know than you think you know so in my case, I don't know. I'm here to uh, seek some help from the, the project management experts here to, to have more conversations on this. Like this is like, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to end this conversation with the solutions, but this is the first step in our conversations to have more in the future right. where we can talk and see like what are the best things we can do together. At the end right. of the day, we're helping our patients. We're not helping any uh, industry in specific, but we're helping our patients. We're helping the healthcare uh, uh, industry and the landscape. Good. I don't know if I answered your question. Um, you, but... you did actually, you did, and I, I think we, as as you don't know, we need to know what you don't know. Exactly. I guess. Uh, and for us to do that, um, there has to be some kind of discussions, visitations, to to learn more about what you do, and you learn about what we do, to find what is it that we both don't know to work on. Exactly. Uh, right. and, excellent. And Amar, that is exactly where I am coming into the play as well here in this uh, in this uh, you know ecosystem of medical affairs and project management. Just go based upon you know the, the work that I have done within the pharma industry. Um, in, in in basically you know when a drug goes through this, there are three stages, right? Like you know first the animal trials and then the human trials and then you know the post uh, um, approval, it is uh, getting marketed and stuff like that. So when a drug is getting actually going through this whole process, we think of what this is indicated for. In in you know in 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 the normally we say you know this drug is indicated for X Y Z, right? In a project management context, we look at you know did we do everything right? Efficiency. Oh. And, you know, um, are we selecting the right problem to solve? That's more about effectiveness and leadership, right? But in, in, a, in a healthcare world, there is a third E that we call as efficacy. The, to the extent this particular solution is solving the actual problem. In the case of, uh, you know, drug, yes, I took this particular medicine and is it really solving that particular problem? Yes or no. The other thing is the physicians may be using the same drug because of the combinations, the constitutions, the chemical uh, you know, nature of it, small molecule, large molecule, and many other reasons. They may actually use it for some other purpose other than what it is indicated for. So what are some of those important safety information that we need to make sure that the physicians are aware of? 
And then the fat balance in communicating that, you know, if you do this, I'm sure all of you must have heard this in, in a TV advertisement. You know, they will basically say this is a wonderful drug to solve this particular problem. And then towards the end, they will basically read in, you know, um, uh, you know, to 100 X speed. Uh, this drug is meant for this, 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 this and all those things. That kind of, you know, risk awareness thinking. That kind of thinking about like what are the things that you are not thinking through as part of each and every one of those stages. So there is a gap in the medical affairs team to know about project management and program mm -hmm. management. And there is a gap in the way project management and program managers are not knowing about the medical affairs. Right. So it's not solving IT problem today. It's right. solving medical problems. So we need to start thinking in terms of how do we change our mindset for this particular solution thinking? So when we address this gap, we will be able to have more discussions. But the idea here is not necessarily to know what I think I know, rather than come to the table with a clean slate and say, here is my problem. You yeah. tell me what are the things exactly. that you need to know so that we can educate you and the same way around. Uh, absolutely. And I have to stress uh, one one point you mentioned, um, sir. Yep. I was going to keep talking because we don't have a lot of questions, but I see things popping up now in, in the chat box. Yep. But you mentioned something very important, which is, unfortunately, now we think about one tool fits all, which is not the right approach. Um, there has to be some kind of uh, adaptation, some kind of... Um, alignment of what the problem is. Uh, Dr. Prem and Dr. Pratati, they talked a lot about a lot of operational issues, which is I see that they talk about the resource planning, uh, how, how to do things. And you mentioned a very beautiful point, which is the lean business thinking. So it's not it's not always agile framework or, or it's not always project management or it's not always um, that that methodology that's going to solve. I think you have to think about what is the problem first to approach to 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 the solution. So I think that is very important and I just wanted to point that out. So thank you so much for, for mentioning that. Um, let me go I, back. I do believe that if that's okay, um, one of the important things I heard uh, in this presentation, so thank you very much, uh, that was excellent, um, is the idea of evidence-based uh, decision-making. Uh, that's extremely uh, important. I also uh, support uh, evidence-based de decision making, uh, and in a, in addition to data and data uh, analytics, I believe you need access to to scientific research. Um, uh, and I was wondering um, whether you're facing any challenges in 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 terms of accessing quality scientific. Uh, research in the medical affairs function and how you are addressing it, if you'd like to talk a bit about that. Yeah, no, I, I will take uh, the stab first, maybe, brother, to join me. Uh, well, that's a great question. Actually, in I should say, like, in, in contrary, we're not, we're facing challenge in a different way because the amount of scientific data that's coming out, the scientific research uh, manuscripts or the publications coming out is, like, 72 times more than it used to be back in 2010, right? Mm -hmm. It means we have around 700,000, uh, I would say, uh, publicly available uh, manuscripts being published every year. There's, there's a uh, humongous amount of information that's been published. Mm -hmm. The challenge is not to have access to that. It's the challenge is about how do you pick the right information for your use? Right, right. the amount of data you have. So that is the challenge we are having. It's not about the access issues because with all the technology that we have, with all the investments we made towards like the digital uh, technology and resources, the challenge mm -hmm. is about like, how do you take that um, 700,000 kind of research publications and then use the right information? And, and uh, glad that we are having this artificial intelligence. We're trying to learn more about it and see how we can use that kind of emerging um, innovative technologies to to make our lives easy because imagine like mm. me reading like 10,000 articles in a year um, mm. uh, yeah my lifespan would be uh, much shorter yeah I, and that was actually uh, uh, one full of questions I, I had uh, in, in terms of how you might be using artificial intelligence and, and I and I think a use case here is probably about looking at uh, the quality of the scientific papers available to you. This is um, 
an ex excellent idea, and I think that it might actually work. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. Great. Thank you so much. Um, there were no questions. Actually, there's one one question about who's responsible for the quality. Is it the project manager? Uh, that is a general question. Uh, can, what can do you I, think from your perspective? Can Can I take that and then I will let please, you know. please. no please um, quickly please. <laughs> If, if you look at, take a look at the quality definition, conformance to requirements and fitness for use, quality is everyone's responsibility. Right. Quality is not my responsibility. It's not like a salt that we add towards the end of the you know food preparation. It is like the selection of the right ingredients right from the beginning and all the way till the, you know it is consumptions. So it is everyone's responsibility. Project managers' responsibilities today are getting you know distributed and delegated in uh, you know the the team. When you talk about agile, is uh, somehow the tester going to you know be responsible for quality? When you take a look at uh, inspection, um, is somehow the procurement department uh, responsible for quality? No, quality is everyone's responsibility. That is the fundamental difference that I want to emphasize. Whether you are doing medical affairs, financial, insurance, uh, you know, lumber division, or whatever it is that you are doing, the instant we think quality is someone's responsibility, we are failing. Quality is everyone's responsibility. I just wanted right. to emphasize that. So. Th thank you, sir. And uh, the good thing is Les agrees with you, so that's a blessing. Oh, that's a blessing. <laughs> so, uh, Dr. Pratati uh, and Dr. Prem, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. This is a great insight into the healthcare, and this is why we have the symposium, is to have different perspectives, different people from different industries. So we're very happy to have you here, and thank you again for, for joining us. Yeah, um, if I can leave a last note before, uh, if that's okay with you. So like I said, this is the first step and we would love to have more conversations in this regard. So if you would like to connect with us, Prati and I would be more than happy. And of course, Sriram is our advisor for the project management and program management. So we are open for more conversations. This is not just a presentation to show what we do. It's about like, well, we have problem, we need help. <laughs> so uh, I, want, I want the team to see that way. And if you don't mind, reaching up to us and we'll be having uh, more conversations with you on this. Excellent. Thank you so much. I just did. So I sent you a LinkedIn request. Make sure to accept oh, it. <laughs> I definitely will. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you so much. We will Thanks take so a break much. and we'll come back at, um, I believe, one o'clock for the next presentation from a different industry as well. So thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Thank everyone. you. Thank you so much. Thank you.